you get experience right after you most need it. <laughs> right. Welcome to Mosaic of China, a podcast about people who are making their mark in China. I'm your host Oscar Fuchs. Today we are putting a spotlight on the foreigner teacher, and there's something very special about this subject because it's one of the most common ways for foreigners to find their first job, their first identity, and their first footing into a new country like China. It's how I first came to Asia 20 years ago, and I'm sure if you weren't one too, you certainly know someone who was. For some people, it's a stepping stone into something else in that new country, and for others, like today's guest Seth Harvey, it becomes a gateway into a longer-term career in education. Our conversation gets into its flow when we discuss how Seth interfaces with the education system and the family unit in China. And it's a story that reminds us how working with young adults offers teachers a unique window into the society in which they operate, and indeed where that society might be heading in the future. Seth is a mellow talker, so today's episode has the feel of an avuncular fireside chat. So let's slow it down, relax, and take a listen. I'm here with Seth Harvey, and Seth, you do a lot of things, but I guess the principal thing that you do is you're an admissions advisor, right?、Uh, correct. Yes,、um, I work for a company that helps students plan, prepare, and apply to school overseas. Very cool. I know you're involved in education because, of course, you were referred by Lizanthia last season. So let's hear what Lizanthia had to say. I'm going to send my friend Seth Harvey your way. Seth is the much maligned、uh, English teacher.、Nice. He is coaching Chinese kids for American universities. Right. So I think you'll have some good questions to ask him about what Chinese kids experience in education. Lizanthia, what is your relationship with her? Um, Lasanthia is, is amazing. She is engaged to my best friend. If you want to hop into the object that I brought today, it's actually、uh, kind of related to all of that, so it's a, a nice transition. Great, show me.、Um, all right, let me pull it out here.、Um, I just put on the table a weathercock.、Um, so it is a small rooster figurine. And the reason I picked this item is it, it represents a lot of things about my lifestyle in China.、Um, so first, it was a gift that was brought back by my best friend and Lasanthia from Portugal. My best friend's Portuguese. This little thing、uh, changes colors by the weather. Wow, I can't believe that something so analog can actually be so high tech at the same time. Right,、um, that's a pretty good analogy for China.、Um, <laughs> right, a lot of things are so very advanced, and a lot of things are still relying on, on old traditional ways. It does a great job of mixing new and old together. Your experience in China has been all in Shanghai, right?、Uh, yes, I've I've never lived anywhere else.、Um, I have no interest in living in any other cities. For me, I'm a la Shanghai Ning. So that's the local dialect for I'm Shanghainese.、Um, I'm a huge fanboy of Shanghai. In my mind, Shanghai is the best city in the world. And I, I'm here definitely by choice. And how long have you been here now altogether? I first came in 2009,、uh, a visit with a friend from my university, just a summer vacation for three weeks. We did Shanghai and Guangzhou, and I remember having this feeling of,、um, man, it's all happening here. I was in business school at the time, and I came home, and I, I think I was really、uh, impacted by this three-week trip. About every other sentence, I started with in China, in China, in China. I annoyed everybody, all my friends and family. So I said I'm, I'm going to come back, and in 2011, on three weeks' notice, I decided I was going to move here for a year. I had friends that had kind of taught English. I said I, I can do something. So I got on a plane with、um, no job, no place to live. I didn't really know anyone in Shanghai. I didn't speak any Chinese. It's pretty scary, a big risk. And I came here and I made it work for、uh, a little over a year, 2011 to 2012. And I returned back to school, finished school, worked a little bit in the U.S. And I moved back here in 2015, and I've been here since. Yeah, that speaks to a certain tenacity about you, right? You you didn't have any plans, but you had the bravery just to come here on a whim, almost.、Uh, tenacity is a nice word.、Uh, stupidity it would be another way to say it. <laughs> Let's jump into that then. So, tell us about what your job within the field of education actually is. Right. So, I, I've had a number of different roles with different companies over the last five years. I was working for Xin Dongfang,、uh, China New Oriental. They're the largest education company in China.、Uh, 
they cover every single service you could think about, from English training to sending kids overseas to giving prep lessons for test prep, um, for everything of all ages. Uh, in January, I transitioned to a smaller boutique firm, and we're doing the same kind of service, and we're focused on sending Chinese students abroad. For years now, there's been a trend uh, to send students abroad at various stages of their education. So some kids go for middle school, uh, boarding schools, some kids go for high school, and a growing number are going abroad for universities, probably even more popular. Uh, my role comes in at the very end of the process, um, where we advise them on preparing themselves in this last year to do everything they can to shine on a college application. So that's everything from recommending and advising extracurricular activities to planning out their standardized test dates and kind of keeping track of their process and making sure that they're on track or that we're starting to address corrections that need to be made. And you're not involved in teaching them, but you see the product that the education system makes of them. They come almost fully formed, but then you have to mold them for the next stage. Is that a, a good enough description? Um, I wouldn't say that's super accurate. What we're trying to teach them and the ideas we're trying to get them to understand are, are quite different than in an academic setting. We're more focused on developing them uh, personally to help them start to form an idea of who they are and what they would like to do. I don't actually feel like there's a lot of overlap between um, school learning and the kind of realizations and learning that I'm trying to help them achieve. Does that say something about the education system? Well, I think there's a lot of things to say about the education system, and no one has it perfect. I don't think that it's possible to have some kind of system that's that large that is going to work for everyone. There's a, a long-standing stereotype um, that, that, that the education system produces a certain kind of result, which is robotic, not being creative, or they're very hardworking, but um, it, it's a bit formulaic. You can give them an input and they produce an output, but there's not a lot of variance in there. It's been likened to a factory um, where it's just you're mass producing people. And you gotta, if you look at it from a, kind of a, a more zoomed out perspective by the government, um, it's kind of smart. I don't think that the correct approach is to try to produce, you know, a million Elon Musks a year. That's not really sustainable or it doesn't kind of work on a societal level. One thing about Chinese people is I feel like they're especially good at long-term planning. Um, they're very patient and they, they kind of look farther ahead. Um, so you see this in how they approach education. You see this how they approach their careers. You see it um, how they approach politics in this country, um, if you're tuned into those kind of things. But I work with maybe a certain section of students that are looking to kind of break out of that. The Chinese system to go to university relies on a test called the Gaokao, a famed test. And this is like the most important test of any Chinese student life. It is incredibly rigorous and competitive, and it is incredibly determinative of your future. So a lot of uh, parents start their children on a path which allows them to sidestep the Gaokao by looking to go abroad. It takes a lot of the pressure off and it opens up different opportunities. Which makes them what? That makes them privileged? That makes them slightly countercultural? Like, what kind of parents put their children into that situation? Well, mm, I, I wouldn't say that it's so radical. I think that it's parents that have a, a different approach. So I think that you have this younger generation of parents in their 40s to 50, and they grew up in a certain way, um, and they remember how it was, and they're trying to help their kids have a better approach to it. They say, you know, you want to give the children things you never had, and another quote is to teach your children things you were never taught. They're very family focused and um, they're very focused on trying to elevate the opportunities in the life of, the, of that next generation. That's the responsibility that they take on when they have children. I think the, the planning process, it starts, you know, the, it probably starts the first time they get the pregnancy test back. Um, so it's not one of those things that's, that's done when the child's 15 or 16. It's done when they're like two or three. And this process all starts from they, they, they're getting enrolled in, in preschools and daycares where they're being exposed to English and they're trying to promote, you know, more cognitive development. It, it's a modern day competition. It's like, you know, how do I get the smartest kid and the best results? And a child is a parent's greatest investment here, all for the dream of going to a, a Harvard or a Cambridge or a brand name school. There will be people listening to this in different countries thinking, oh, yeah, well, that's the same as my country. We are giving our kids too many standardized tests. 
and pushing them too hard in that approach. Do you think that actually they are similar or do you think China has a, a specific type of examination system? The average Chinese student goes to school for about 10 hours a day or more. And on top of that, the student's going to do about four hours of homework or extra classes or prep. So you're looking at a 14-hour day. Now, most of us who work a full-time job, we work eight hours a day. You know, we have a lunch break and things like that. Imagine being shuffled from class to class and being tested, examined. You need to listen. You need to be engaged and focused. You know, for 14 hours a day, it's, it's mentally exhausting. You're, you're basically a mental triathlete. And you're talking about middle schoolers. So just the sheer rigor of the day-to-day to keep up with the, the amount of homework that they're given and not get left behind is incredible. So on, the, on one hand, I think that these students are missing out on certain opportunities to develop um, their interests, to, to maintain a happier childhood you know, that we kind of want. But on the other hand, I, I actually think it's a necessary evil. I think kids in this system are learning important personal characteristics that benefit them later in life. So the struggle that they're experiencing now, where they're in middle school or high school, I think it helps them become diligent. It helps them manage their time. It helps them kind of stay focused and push through. And once they learn to do that, it gives them a little bit of a a competitive advantage over their, their foreign peers or counterparts, where I think in the West, we're a little bit more entitled and individualistic and things are a little bit softer. And the reality of the world is, you know, life's tough. When you get out into the real world and you have to work, you know, not all jobs are super fun and you're going to do your passion. But at least Chinese students, they have learned to kind of put their head down, to grin and bear it, and to work through it. There are upsides to this approach. So when you first encounter these children, at what stage do you usually start working with them? I would like to start working with them as early as possible. So the reason that my industry exists It's because Western and Eastern education, we value different things. So we had talked about how test-based the Chinese education system is. Basically, everything is done on a test score. Um, So if you're on a test and it's out of 1,000 points, well, if you got 995 and someone else got 994, well, then you get the spot and they don't. But in the West, we use something called a a holistic approach where, yes, uh, test scores, academics are important, but we try to look at kind of every angle. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you scored high enough. There's no magic number on a test that will get you admitted. That's kind of just a precursor, a prerequisite to meet a minimum threshold to show competency. And then we start to look at uh, other factors, um, which would be like reading your essays, trying to get to know your interest. Maybe there's an interview and to get to know you on a personal level to decide if you're going to be a good, successful candidate who comes and contributes to our academic institution, our community, those kind of things more than just can you take a test. So a battle that I have to fight is to try to allocate more time, more effort, more resources to developing that personal story and away from preparing for tests. So we, we could say I work in education, but I kind of feel that I work in marketing. What my job basically is, is I'm trying to create a brand or a profile for these students. It's a sales pitch. Every kid that applies to Harvard has a great SAT score. They have done some community service. They have uh, an English competency. These kind of things have become homogenized. And for a Chinese applicant, they kind of just fit into the same pattern. So my job is to try to help them break this pattern, to try to give them some kind of hook, something that makes them different. We, we talked about the day of a student, a 14-hour day. Well, there's not a lot of time or energy left over for, for thinking about things. So I, I try to help coach students to understand some really important attributes. I try to help them understand what schools are looking for. And that's part of branding, right? Step one, know your audience, know your customer, understand the need, understand the want uh, before you can create a sales pitch. Um, Chinese are, are very collective. And the problem that creates is that uh, Chinese people, they, they go with the flow. Um, they're always looking at uh, their neighbors, their family, friends, their classmates, their peers. They're trying to you know, keep up with the Joneses, right? In the West, we, we, we kind of value rebels and rule breakers and iconoclasts. And that's something that's not very typical of the the average Chinese uh, student. Is it not just a case of the ability to stand out more fundamentally? Yeah, I think so. Um, But how do you do that, Oscar? You know, how do you stand out? Maybe now you know because you have a life experience. You've tried different things. You've had careers. You've met a lot of different people. But if you look at the background of these students, the hard part is they don't know who they are. And no one's ever asked them that. 
um, most of the time they're picking like a major or what they want to study. They're picking it for one of two reasons. The first reason would be that they've done well in school and they've gotten kind of positive feedback from teachers or grades and someone said, hey, you're good at this. So they said, well, I'm, everybody likes things that they're good at, right? Uh, so they say, I'll go and pursue that. Or the second reason is it's what their parents have done. Um, my dad is an engineer or my dad is in business and that's what I want to do. Um, parents tend to be, I think, even a stronger role model here. And I don't really want to get into the psychology of parent-child relationships in China and how they're different than, than in the West. But um, I think that those kind of factors play a, a, a role as well. In both those examples, it's either they've been told they're good at something or they're following their parents. But there isn't this third option where it's what I want to do. Well, China, things develop very quickly here, and I feel there's a tide changing where we're seeing um, more relaxed parents and we're seeing children who are uh, becoming more vocal in the things that they want, and they're starting to be able to or feel confident enough to kind of push back against maybe outside uh, guidance and to follow what they like. And it's, it's quite amazing. You know, you're seeing a big trend for students who are very interested and then get active in a number of issues that wasn't common just five years ago the environment and making things cleaner, safer, better. Social issues is becoming big, so the idea of justice and the, the role of government. Um, students are, are, are starting to think about these things, starting to do projects about these things. They're, they're getting involved. So these types of students that have access to more of a, an international path, they're starting to take part in, in different competitions, different organized events. So a very popular one is called China Thinks Big. And China Thinks Big is a, a research-based competition where they're trying to solve some kind of problem. They can pick anything that they're interested in, and they do this in a, a group-based project. Or YOC, which is Youth Observers Competition, where they need to write a six- to eight-page article with graphics and, and research. Um, so these type of competitions, they start to challenge students and, and to make them think and engage with, with the outside world and be curious. We're talking quite generally until now. Sure. Can you think of one individual or perhaps another one where you have taken them through this story and seen them on their way to an American university? I've got one student right now, and he's really interested in architecture. And the problem is that this student is kind of struggling right now to maintain a, a high enough GPA, and he's struggling with his test prep and meeting SAT and TOEFL requirements. So this summer, he's going to use a summer vacation to focus on, on test prep and try to get those numbers up. And of course, his dad's an architect. Uh, and the other, other hobby he has is um, cycling. So instead of spending all of his time doing test prep this summer, I would like him to do something interesting. I would like to push him. So for example, I say, hey, I looked up and I found that you can cycle from Chengdu to Lhasa, Tibet. And there's a, a plotted out itinerary, and it takes 27 days. It has it plotted out step by step, day by day, what you're going to do. And yes, it's going to be tough, but you're taking a journey. I think you personally develop from this kind of thing. Um, so then when it comes down to application time, right, you've got two paths where it's either take a risk and challenge yourself to do this cycling trip or study and improve your standardized test scores, right? So you've got A path, B path. If you take path A, you have something interesting to write about. And I think this experience kind of matures you and gives you substance, right? And on the path B, if you study and you apply to universities, you say, look at my test scores. And they say, okay, great, that, that meets our minimum requirement. So what kind of student are you? What are you interested in? And there's nothing behind that door. Um, so that's a real challenge, a struggle of, of my job is trying to help them see the value. So you say, I want you to go cycling. And they say, but that doesn't improve. That doesn't improve my grades. I'm not learning. That's not education. And I'm trying to tell them, yes, it is. There's a, a personal education. I said, you spent the last you know, 13 years doing academic studying. It's time to afford a little bit of time to develop yourself and, and get yourself prepared. So what happened? Could you persuade him? I'm negotiating right now. Right. And I'm guessing that means with the parents, right? Right. Parents are typically open-minded, um, but... Part of our service is opening up opportunities. This is something that they would have never considered or thought of without maybe an outside presence. And you know, students who are like, I've never done anything like this before. Like, here's your roadmap. Here's your, your objective. Go, do, try. If they fail, they fail, they come back. But you know, that, that's still learning right there. There's, there's learning and failure. What is it about you then that makes you so well fit for this job? I like that I'm still involved with, with students and 
something about working with uh, younger people, like teenagers, you know, it kind of breathes in some life into your job. You know, they're still very optimistic and ambitious and they, ha- they have kind of big ideas and they're maybe naive, but in a nice way. And I think also it's kind of fulfilling a part in myself where I, I think that I've made a lot of mistakes. And I think the fact that I have screwed up and I have done things in, in a non-traditional or the wrong way or that I failed at things, I think that's something that makes me good at my job. I find myself repeating a lot of um, idioms from my dad, but he said, um, you get experience right after you most need it. <laughs> right. It gives me a chance to take that wisdom and that knowledge that I've accumulated and at least pass it along. Someone can be older, but if they have never tried, if they have never you know, taken risks, if they've never failed, then I'm not sure how much wisdom they have to offer. Um, would you like to talk about one of your failures or would you rather not? Um, you want me to get into a divorce or startup companies or? I don't. It's totally <laughs> up to you. Uh, I think all of those things. But ultimately, when you look back later in life, I think those kind of things give you character, give you grit, make you interesting, and they make you more successful in other parts of your life. Well, you just used the word grit, and I think with there's so much change going on, you have to be resilient. So I totally think that your experience is a good life lesson for the kids that you're mentoring. Yeah, it's not really something that you can fake. Amen. On that note, uh, let's move on to part two. All right. The 10 questions. Question one. What is your favorite China-related fact? The sport of football, soccer, was actually invented in China. England takes credit for it, but it actually predates England, and football is a Chinese sport. That's a good one. I think the English, we are the ones who invented the rules. So we like to invent rules and plant flags and stuff like that. (laughs) Yeah. Number two, do you have a favorite word or phrase in Chinese? In Chinese, uh, there's a word um, in Mandarin, it would be like, mei shi. And that means like, it's nothing, like, don't worry about it. And in like a Shanghainese dialect, it would be like, mei si. Like, they don't really do the sh, it's just like si. If you throw a little Shanghainese dialect in there, man, it just really opens people up. What is your favorite destination within China? Um, I like Hong Kong because they have a horse track there. I love to go to the Happy Valley and and gamble on horse races. If you left China, what would you miss the most and what would you miss the least? What would I miss? Um, Man, have you ever tried to take a taxi in New York City? Uh, It's like $30 to put your hand on the the handle. This is such a well-planned out city. Um, It seems so big, but I I find that getting around it from one side to the other is is amazing. Um, Like I said, you can take the bus, you can take the metro, and you can call a cab for like two bucks to go anywhere. Um, The thing I will miss the least would be, ah, man, like the construction, that hammer drill. Mm. Like um, everyone knows that. And I think everyone's had an apartment where somebody's been renovating next door. So that's a trade-off for the amount of change and development that we enjoy and we love. Um, Sometimes that that comes back and is a huge negative. Is there anything that still surprises you about life in China? I was walking out of my office the other day and there was a guy and he had a turtle on a stick. (laughs) <laughs> like, I, I think some of us like maybe know what I'm talking about, but I think it's his pet turtle. So he's got a string wrapped around its shell and then a stick. And he just like carries it around with him and hangs out. You just never know what you're going to see. Every day, something new surprises me. And like, I feel like that's a, a huge value. It's a, one of the things that I really love the most here is that it's a very unpredictable place. Nice. Where is your favorite place to go to eat or drink or just hang out? I play on a billiards team once a week, um, a bar called Park 91 on Dagulu near People's Square. It's a pretty cool, chill place, the kind of place I can walk behind the counter and pour my own beer and feel very at home there. Shanghai can be a bit of a, a materialistic vibe to it, a bit of a status-seeking, show-off, a luxury-prone kind of, of way. Um, and I'm just a simple guy from the Midwest. I have no interest in things that are pretentious. What is the best or worst purchase you made in China? Maybe a gym membership is like a great one. I got a four-year gym membership and exercise is something that I started doing regularly that kind of grounds my life. It works as a balancing factor. Worth it. What is your favorite WeChat sticker? 
there's two types of WeChat stickers, right? There's ones that are pulled from like famous pop culture shows or cartoons and things, but you can actually make your own stickers. So my girlfriend sends me ones of her that she's made of herself. So then I find it really useful to send herself back to her, <laughs> uh, like a little bit like sarcastically. Okay, like the second one, you know, stickers are a great way to end a conversation. You know, sometimes people say something outlandish or, you know, communication is tough. And uh, I like the, the this one of this, whoever this actor is, you know, it just... Uh, aghast for words and I was like I don't know what to say back to that you know sometimes you just get flustered and just let, let's end it there I use this one a lot yeah <laughs> what's your favorite go-to song to sing at KTV oh sorry I, I'm such a big hater of KTV Ooh, I know but for me like um, I haven't got it like memorized down but there's a Chinese song called Weishamani Beijer Wa I Bie Ren and that translates to like why did you betray me why did you love someone else but for me like that's that song that represents my first year in China and it was always on the radio and it has this very super nice like melody da 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 and um, whenever you try to sing this in KTV it depresses all of the Chinese people because oh. it's a very like, sad and an emotional song and it's like you know why did you betray me why did you cheat on me you stabbed me in the back you know you went off someone else but man the melody is so nice so <laughs> I guess that's my KTV revenge is that I told you I didn't want to go and now I'm going to depress all of you with this beautiful, sad song. <laughs> the perfect weapon. Very good. And finally, what other China-related sources of information do you use? I, of course, use Smart Shanghai. Like, that's my number one go-to thing. I read everything. Mm. I read every article. I'm looking at what events are going on. Like, um, I even have, like, a pastime, like, hobby of I love going through all the apartment listings. I'm basically an uncertified apartment agent. I can tell you what the market value of things are and how the market's doing. I even love going through the, the classifieds. And secondly, I use WeChat quite a lot. I am the biggest lurker of group chats. Oh. I lurk in so many group chats. I get all of this information inside. People are like, how do you know that? Group chat. Yeah. Um, everything from uh, foodie and restaurant groups to exercise, um, cooking, um, social events. Uh, I'm even in a dad's group. <laughs> so there's a group for like expat fathers, like a big one. And they talk about all kinds of stuff. Um, and I have no kids and I don't really remember how I, someone put me into this group, but I never left and I just lurk and I get so much great information from that. <laughs> well, thank you. And before you leave, the only question remaining is, who would you recommend for the next season of Mosaic of China? Right, so I have a friend named uh, Anton. Um, he's an Israeli guy that's been in China for a number of years. What's really interesting about him is he speaks like perfect Mandarin. Wow. So he's a very disciplined guy. He works in online gaming, like the gaming industry here. Um, and he works in a Chinese company and you know he will be able to provide some, some insights to a totally different industry that none of your other guests have talked about, but also have a very different experience as a, a foreigner living in China who is totally plugged in and adaptive in communicating um, with locals. Thank you so much. And thank you in general. It was really great to have you here and I look forward to the next time we can meet. And my pleasure. Thanks, Oscar. If today's episode has sparked your interest, the best accompaniment is my conversation with Zhang Zhiyuan from episode 3 of this season. Zhiyuan is in a very similar position to Seth because he is working with the product of an education system that measures everyone quantitatively and as a humanities professor at Shanghai Jiao Tong University, he needs to evaluate them qualitatively. And speaking of quality, there's an extra 10 to 15 minutes of quality conversation for every episode of the season in the premium version of the show on Patreon or iFadian. As always, head to mosaicofchina.com for instructions on how to subscribe. And here are a few clips from today's show. You have some students that are, are really sharp and mature and you have others that have just no clue. I actually have a, a Shanghainese family. It's one of the things that I think not a lot of foreigners who come here have experienced. She's like this little Chinese girl who's a finance nerd, and she like does like MMA and Muay Thai and boxing. Now I'm getting excited. I want to know more about that. There's not a lot of room for discussion. And if I teach you two plus two equals five, and I put it on the exam, and you write four, you're wrong. And I think storytelling is one of the most useful skills that you can have. And any major brand today in their advertisements, they tell a story. I thought that the way that I grew up and the way that we did things was correct. Until you step outside of it, you don't see it. 
while you're there, you can also check out the images from today's show. There's Seth with his object, the Portuguese weathercock. He told me that when his cock is light blue, it means that the weather will be sunny but overcast. Now isn't that a handy thing? There's his favourite WeChat sticker, which is a great one to use at the end of a confusing conversation. There are some photos of him with a few of his students and their families, and there's a bunch of other stuff too. Apart from on the website, you can also follow the images on Instagram and Facebook. Just type in Mosaic of China and you'll find us there, or add me on my WeChat ID, Mosaic of China, and I'll add you to the listeners group there. Oh, and the update of the student who wanted to study architecture is that he was accepted into his first choice of college, which was the top-ranked architecture program at Syracuse University. Mosaic of China is me, Oscar Fuchs, with artwork by Denny Newell. Coming up is a catch-up with the pain management expert Lizanthea Taylor from Season 1, Episode 28, the now wife of Seth's best friend and the person who recommended him for the show. And if you do end up tuning into Lysanthia's original episode, listen out for the way she answered the final question in the totally opposite way to Seth. Lysanthia. Hi, Oscar. There are a few people who I'm doing these updates with who I'm literally getting as they have just stepped off the plane. You've been here now a few weeks, right? I'm, I'm just over a month back. So almost a whole year away, which is just bizarre. <sighs> well, it's so nice to see you. Why don't you just quickly mention what your story was since then until now? Well, I left the country just before Chinese New Year and thought I was just going to jaunt off for a, a short trip to the US for a conference. And then I couldn't get back. Then I went to Australia, which is my where I'm from. Then I had to get a very last minute flight into Portugal, which was where I was due to get married and meet my now husband, and got the almost last flight in. When the plane took off from Qatar, I was very relieved because I figured I wouldn't like to spend any time in Qatar, stranded. Uh, and so I managed to get to Portugal, get locked down in Portugal and stayed there for most of the year. <laughs> We had to cancel the original wedding. So the original wedding was meant to be the big 150 person, everyone flying in from overseas, bonanza of a wedding. And that couldn't happen. And you sort of do have to curl up in a corner and cry a little bit. And then you can pull yourself back out of it and you can say, well, what is possible? So what was possible was we did get married a few months later in a different kind of way. We were allowed 20 people. And that meant we got to have immediate family and best friends. We got to have an amazing day. We got through the bureaucracy. Because you can imagine, I'm Australian, but I'm not a resident of Australia. My husband is Portuguese, not a resident of Portugal. And both of us live in China, but we want to get married. And I think in the end, the authorities eventually just went, oh, let them do it. <laughs> yeah, because I guess if they're not used to it, they're just going to say no, right? Yeah, it ended up being people just kind of looking at us with, with crossed eyes and sort of sighing. Like, <laughs> what, do you, what, you guys want what? It's more like, oh, you've made my life so difficult. Like, where is the paperwork for this particular arrangement? <laughs> you know, this year, hasn't it, for, for all of us, has been interruptions. Maybe a kind of a enforced mindfulness, let's say. Mm. You know, to be in Portugal, and, you know, Portugal has some beautiful coastlines. So I spent a lot of time on the beach, and I got to know this beach the tides, the times of day, the rock pools, even you know, the, the people, the culture. And that was an enormous blessing. Right, slowing down to an extreme degree where you're looking at literally the shells on the beach. Exactly. I did start a business as well. Oh, well, you were a physiotherapist. You probably still are. I'm intrigued. What was your new company? So yes, I am still a physio. So I've come back and I'm still seeing patients I now work at in Sujo. So a couple of days a week. You're working in Sujo? I'm working in Sujo. You know, I'm the only Western trained physio in a city of 19 million people. Well, well, congratulations. Thank you. It's always a new adventure for me. So that was nice to come back to. 
And it's not that far to commute to, right? I guess you wouldn't do it every day, but how long does it take you to get there? It's two hours about each way. But as an Australian, I'm used to it. Uh, about 12 months ago, I started work with an Australian company. So the company itself is called Brain Changer. And Brain Changer is a company started by a person with persisting pain who was able to use the kind of science that I use in the clinic. And she created her own very clever self-management system that she used to recover from persisting pain. And wait a minute. So what can you do remotely? Because when, when I think about what you do as a physio, it's all literally hands-on. <laughs> right. So what is the model? Right. It, you know, It's using more of a health coaching model, which wonderfully can be delivered all by telemedicine. Oh, it's called telemedicine. Telemedicine. So we use video chat. And what's been really good for us has been the way that the pandemic has forced some corporate behavior change. Wow, that's really interesting. So you have like one foot in your China world with the job in Suzhou. You have one foot in Australia. Like, Do you think this is how you're going to try and continue or is this temporary? Like, What, what does 2021 look like from your vantage point now? One of the big things I got to do in Portugal was horse riding. And I've now found a, uh, a horse riding school here. So I can also ride in Shanghai. So for me, 2021 is extending all of those things. Uh, my, my word for the year is, is bloom. I like <laughs> the idea of, of, of blooming because like, to turn into really meaningful things. Well, Lizanthia, I'm going to release this episode alongside the recording of Seth, who you referred for season two. Wonderful. I'm looking forward to hearing that. So have you been in touch with Seth the whole time? So yes, we have been in contact the whole time. He was meant to come to the wedding. His parents were meant to come to our wedding. I'm, I'm really interested to see the kinds of things that he's put into his podcast. Thank you so much, Lizanthia. <laughs> Thank you, Oscar. It's always a pleasure.